that's fine. Good morning, everybody. A few minutes after the hour, we had some technical difficulties. Actually, so this, uh, for everybody that's online, hopefully you're able to join us. We have, actually have a different Zoom number for just today uh, because of a logistical mix-up. But um, anyway, I'd like everybody to um, enjoy their lunch while you're going to learn something about medicinal chemistry. So today we have Ashish Patak here to uh, talk to us about chemistry. We work with Ashish a lot in a U19 program that we have. Uh, it's found at our Antiviral Drug Discovery and Development Center, which is a collaboration between UAB, Southern Research, and then actually a bunch of different other institutions in the US. Working with virologists, who then work with Ashish's team to develop and design uh, new compounds to treat infectious diseases. So she's been really fun to work with. I think he likes to learn about biology and explain chemistry to non-chemists. So hopefully we will learn something today as well. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'm gonna just talk about uh, hit to lead chemistry, what we perform at Southern Research for different projects. So we are heavily involved with Alabama Drug Discovery Alliance projects. So I work with a lot of biologists from UAB uh, and work very closely with the assay development group at Southern Research. Uh, today, what I'm gonna talk about, basically I'm gonna talk about what are the general strategies we take for a drug discovery program, uh, starting from the high throughput screening to uh, preclinical studies. So I'm a principal scientist. I have been a Southern Research for the last 18 years and worked in different, different areas, but at this moment, my lab is mainly focused on uh, antibacterial diseases and antiviral diseases. I have few anti-cancer programs also. So basically, I'm gonna talk about, so this is the uh, CETA NIH grant, uh, so Antiviral Drug Discovery and Development Center that come out from the UAB. So Rich Ricky is the PI on this one. We have uh, four major projects. Uh, so one is a flavivirus project. Uh, so basically we look into dengue and West Nile and this is in collaboration with Oregon Health Science University. Our second project is coronavirus and basically we are dealing with SARS infection in this case and this is with Vanderbilt University. Alpha virus, we have picked two. Uh, viruses, chikungunya and beef, and influenza is three different strains we are working on uh, with UAB and SR, so that's a joint project again. Uh, this project has two major cores, so one is a high throughput screening core and assay core, uh, where we develop, uh, where we do the high throughput screening, and after that, once we start doing the structure activity relationship studies, uh, we do the assays up at SR. Uh, and then we have a medicinal chemistry and lead development group. Uh, that's that's what I lead over there. So if we look at, can we hmm. move this? No. Side? Just oh, make it somewhere. Wow. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so. This program, basically, I'm gonna talk about a little bit specific aim, how we go after uh, drug discovery. So basically, the specific aims for this program, uh, and especially the lead development core, we have, uh, we need to identify screening aids from antiviral HTS screens. Uh, we actually use some uh, previous MLPCN screens funded by NIH in this program, and also we had six different new screens using newer compounds from the SR repository. Then we are supposed to do uh, optimize these chemical hits uh, for the antiviral activity through medicinal chemistry. Uh, next, we try to do optimize the pharmacokinetic properties so that these compounds are more drug-like. And then provide integrated informative support including uh, compound tracking, data analysis, data storage, backup, and the retrieval of a lot of data means uh, we have screened up about more than 200,000 compounds per screen so there is a lot of data and then we made a lot of analogs of that so we support that also from SR. So what are the steps basically how, how we start a hit to lead development program so first of all we try we need to identify some hits that are active either on a cell-based assay or on a 
enzyme. So we do, we take three different approaches. So the first approach is the high throughput screening, which is one of the easiest ones to start with. Then we also do structure-based computer design. So if we have a target, we know which is the target, we know the crystal structure, or we have some information, we start docking studies, we have virtual screening platform at SR, where we can screen more than a million compounds. Uh, which are available in the market all over the world. So we can access those libraries and we can use the docking studies to get to a point where we have some hit molecules. Third is, this is an old style of doing medicinal chemistry that somebody has done some work, there are some compounds out there in the literature, we pick up compounds from there and try to change structures and try to create some new IPs through uh, our, our intellectual property uh, space. So it is very important to understand what is a good chemical matter to start with. That's the most important thing, what we have to do. So first thing is, does the compound of the chemical series has a drug-like properties? Structures are not very weird. If you go into the natural product, there are so many chiral centers in there. So we have to really look at the structure and see whether these are small molecules and have drug-like properties in there. And I will go into detail on the drug-like properties which we look into. Can modification be made to the compound of the chemical series to make it a drug like? Because sometimes you don't have much space in the molecule to change and make it a drug like. So that's another thing we look into. Is the compound of the chemical series a dead end? Sometimes what happens, we have compounds, we go into the literature and we see there are about 5,000, 6,000 compounds made. There is already an IP on the structure of that molecule. So we try to avoid those molecules if we cannot create an IP around the molecule. Or oh, there are some functional groups in there that we know that that's going to give you some cytotoxicity in the future. For example, if you take an aromatic micro compounds, you know that's a no-no to start with. So we try to eliminate those compounds from our starting hits. And then clearly the potential of the intellectual property, that's why we, we are at Southern Research to develop some uh, intellectual properties. So if you look at the hit to lead chemistry, so this is a paradigm basically, these are different approaches, how we take it. So this basically uh, slide shows you different approaches and how we go step by step uh, to develop a quality candidate. And this was, this, this cartoon is taken from a BMCL paper. I'm sorry that, uh, yeah, it's right. hidden under there. So basically, so the, the, the main is the high throughput screening right over here. That's the biggest way of uh, getting compounds these days. You can do either biochemical or you can do some cellular assays. So both assays are available at SR. We can convert your lab assays into a high throughput platform. So we have a group that looks at your assays and see how we, we can convert into a HDS platform. And basically, in HTS platform, the main thing is we would like to see that there is no washing. So if we don't have to wash the plate, that's the best way of running a high throughput screen. Otherwise, it creates a lot of problems for us. We can do a phenotypic screen, so that's another way. Uh, in silico screening, that's what I was talking about. If we have a crystal structure, we can do a lot of virtual screening. So that's what we call it. Then we also have a, a fragment library of close to 20,000 compounds in-house uh, that we can use. So, so the fragment-based drug designing is a new, it's like I would say 15 to 20 years has started and there are uh, several drugs uh, in the market that has started from the fragment-based approach. And then we have a focused screen. So we get an apparent hit from there and then we try to analyze those because when you go after a high throughput screening, we have libraries which we have purchased from different different sources from all over the world and we have close to a million compounds in house uh, plated to run in HTS. So there you cannot select compounds at that stage. So you run the compounds because it's cheaper to run the compounds rather than putting a man hours to eliminate bad compounds from there. So after we get a HTS screen, we generally take and look at the Paine's filtration. So the Paine's is a filtration method uh, that actually eliminates close to 400 different skeletons. 
then those are red flags from different different companies, uh, from different uh, research groups. So they have actually created a software which is called Pain Pain's Filtration. Uh, and then we go, we look at the true hits. So that's what we call as a true hit. And then we start the head to lead, uh, hit to lead chemistry. So we try to characterize the lead optimization values. And I'm going to tell you what values are those which we look at it when we start the hit to lead chemistry. That gives us the quality leads. And then those quality leads we try to convert into a drug like molecules, which we call as a quality candidates. So this slide actually tells you that what SR has capabilities. So we have about uh, close to a million small molecules in 384 well format. Uh, they are acquired from different companies and some of the companies are named here like Cambridge, Enamine, Camdev, Select. We have a very specific kinase library that has about 26,000 compounds in there. We also have two different libraries. We have constituted uh, 2,500 FDA approved drugs. And we also have about 460 unapproved drugs that failed either in phase two or phase three of the clinical trial. So we have those molecules in house. And then we also have a fragment library of close to 20,000 compounds. On top of that, Southern Research has been in business for last 70 years, so 71. 71 years. So we have a lot of compounds made in house and specifically we have a big uh, nucleoside based library. Uh, so we have a, more than 14,000 compounds plated from our own repository. This slide actually gives you an idea that what is the general strategy to come up with a lead. So basically I'm gonna give you an antiviral example in here. So. For example, we start with the HTS antiviral screen and the compounds are selected. So basically, in the first screen, we look at the percentage inhibition and then select compounds from there and try to determine 10 point dose response to give us EC50. When we, when we are doing EC50, we also do the CC50 analysis by using the primary cell line, whatever we are using, so that we can have a selectivity index right here. Once we get data from there, we do the clustering analysis and the pain filtration. So as I said, pain filtration is 400, close to 400 structures that have alerts in there. So it filters those compounds. And also clustering analysis gives us, so for example, for a certain scaffold, there are 50 compounds, those are active in this assay. Versus there is another scaffold that has only 10 compounds active in that assay. So the 50 compounds gives us more confidence in our data and we say, yeah, this is a better cluster to start with rather than a poor a single cluster. So we actually look at the data in that way. Once we filter those, so we take those compounds, we try to repurchase those compounds and retest those because sometimes what happens, the plated compound has gone bad over the years. Sometimes there is some impurities in there. So we try to buy newer powder samples of those, we check for purity, and we are sure that this is the structure of this compound, and then we retest those compounds, and the failure rate is about 10 to 15% right there also. So for example, in, in, the, in the antiviral program, we do a hit selection, and we have a cutoff mark of say EC50 less than 50 micromolar, and a cytotoxicity greater than 30 micromolar, so we have approximately two selectivity that's right to start with. And people who work in antiviral, the more important thing in antiviral is whether, whether you can decrease the virus load. That is a very important feature. So there are some compounds you will have a very nice EC50 value, but they will never reach even EC90 value. So that is an important factor for us. So within the, drug, within the antiviral drug discovery program, we actually send these compounds to our collaborators and say, okay, give us virus title reduction at 10 micromolar, whether you are able to achieve EC90 within 10 micromolar or not. If not, that's not a good compound for us to move forward. So from there, the combination of these two data right here, we select compounds, and the first thing we do is we try to do an in vitro ADME. So ADME, generally we do the like solubility, microsomal stability, and we see how these molecules are behaving. And based upon their activity and preliminary ADME properties, we select compounds for SAR. So we do SAR, we, at every step, we try to check the cytotoxicity of the compounds. 
because while you are changing your molecules, you might pick up some cytotoxicity uh, doing chemistry. And then those are the lead compounds and those lead compounds goes into proof of concept studies or mouse model in the antiviral area. So we use mouse model, so we go through that. Okay. Yes, question. So you look at viral titering to kind of see if it's having an effect. Do you look at any other antiviral responses like interferon production or um, at break I or MDA5 upregulation? So if we don't do exactly on the targets at this moment, we generally try to look at the general antivirals. Activity okay. of that compound. Not, looking for the specific not at this moment. Okay. Once we have an optimized compound, then we start doing all these secondary assays on those. Because here we are talking about 50, 60 compounds, and we don't want to go through all 50, 60 compounds. So we select, we try to improve the properties of the molecule, we try to increase the activity, and then take it to the secondary assays. In antiviral drug discovery within the AD3C, we have actually certain cell lines that has those things inbuilt in there. For example, we have cell lines that have a gamma interferon knockout things. We have innate immunity knockout cell lines. So we use those sometimes, but not at this stage. This is too early to do secondary so I'm gonna give you a, a, a HTS screen we performed on chikungunya virus. So this is a cell-based screen. So about close to 200,000 compounds uh, were tested using Vero E6 cell lines because there we got the maximum response. So that was a, the Z value was pretty good on that. So we used Vero E6 cell lines. We used a cell titer glow, CPE based assay. 2,558 compounds showed greater than 50% inhibition. So we selected those 2,558 compounds. Sometimes these numbers are not complete numbers because we try to fill the plates, 384 well plates. So those are like, that's, that's why these are not uh, full numbers. And we do a cell viability assay. So in this case, we actually did two parallel screens on 2,558 compounds using Vero E6 and THF cell lines. THF is more relevant for the pathogen moving forward. So that's why we incorporated that right there. Uh, we selected compounds that has EC50 of less than 10 micromolar and CC50 of greater than 30 micromolar. And then we performed a clustering analysis, pain filtration. From there, we selected, so there were about 44 compounds which were very interesting for us for reconfirmation studies. So we selected about 23 from those 44 based upon our rankings. And we also do some visual inspection on the structures too, because sometimes pain actually misses some of the compounds. So we do manual in inspection of the structures and we eliminate those too. So we have now 23 compounds that, and those 23 compounds went into virus low, uh, viral load reduction assay. So we try to do at a particular concentration, we chose 10 micromolar as a good concentration to see how much, uh, how many logs we are able to reduce the virus type. And from there, we also determine EC90. So any compound which is not showing greater than two logs there, that's not a good compound for us. So we eliminate that compound for further EC90 determination. So that, that's how we are trying to fit in the bottom line. And then from there, we did medicinal chemistry on five heads. So there are other tools to prioritize targets. So sometimes what happens, we know from the literature that a very similar compound has a target there. So we try to take that compound much faster than other compounds and try to find out the target there. If there is a crystal structure known, we go and start doing our docking studies and other kinds of studies. So we use modeling in there and we also use is structure biology and both of these groups are at Southern Research. So we are working very closely with different different groups within SR and chemistry department. So we can purify and crystallize proteins and we can do all kinds of document studies in house. So I'm giving you one example. So there is a chick, we, we have a compound, we know that that's working on NSP3. Uh, and we have the crystal structures, so the crystal structures was determined by our crystallographer Mason Wu in house. So we are, we are going after the ADP ribose pocket of the NSP3. So we did, first, first of all, we performed the optimal soaking protocol in there. Uh, we found close to 40 fragments 
we purchased and we did a soaking studies uh, in, in, into the crystal structure and we found one fragment SR40582. You can see this structure on the right hand side over there. Yes. What's a fragment? Fragment is a small molecule that has a molecular weight less than 150. <clears throat> so if you take that compound, that's not going to work because that compound is just so small, it's not going to have a drug like properties. So you need to add mass onto that. So that's the starting point for us. Sometimes what happens, we get two fragments within the same binding pocket at two different places. That's a very good thing because we can join those two fragments together by a linker and make a, make a better inhibitor there. So this is one of the in, uh, uh, small fragment we found and that's the study going on. Uh, we are trying to develop molecule based upon this scaffold. Uh, and and so, so this is one approach I am, and on the same NSP3, we also did some virtual screening work. So we, we have started with about 30,000 fragments in there, uh, and also we expanded to 120,000 additional fragments, uh, which are available in the market, and th that's being done right now, I will say. Uh, and we use a uh, Schrodinger small molecule discovery suit 2018 to do this. And after that, uh, our computational chemist has started docking about 1.2 million compounds, structures in, 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 in the binding pocket, and that's ongoing right now. So if we get something out from there, we will study those and try to take the molecule from there. So what is the SAR? So structure activity relationship is a very important parameter. That's what we look at. So what is basically if you, if you take SAR, how you can define SAR. So SAR is an activity where we try to increase the potency of the molecule. If there is a cytotoxicity, we try to remove that. We look into the drug-like properties. We try to fix that. So it's a combination of a lot of things we can do. So if you look at this struct, this slide over here, basically we have a scaffold in the middle. We like to optimize this using different types of techniques in, in house. So that's what the slides uh, talk about. So now once we have a compound, we would like to take it forward, optimize it for activity and other properties. One thing which we need to see very, uh, which, which is very important is selection of SAR assay. Because here we are talking about very small changes giving you different, different results. So it's very important to determine SAR. As I have showed you, the chikungunya high throughput screen was done on a cell-based assay. But running that is going to give us more variability. That's why we have chosen an assay that that's going to give us less variability and we can have a better SAR. And that's why we have chosen the chickweed nano loop assay. So we have tagged the chickweed virus with a nano loop and we are going through that assay. So this is the assay, and these you can see here uh, antiviral effect inhibition in the nano loop assay, and the cell viability assay is the bottom panel. So we go through these uh, for every compound we synthesize. So establishing an SAR, so structure activity relationships. Either analogs are purchased, so the first step is because these molecules are commercial, so there might be other analogs available in the market. So we go after those analogs and buy uh, to get a preliminary SAR right there, and then we start synthesizing molecules. All analogs need to be tested for efficacy, selectivity, and toxicity. So we choose in vitro assays around that space. And data is used to feedback or generate more analogs. That, that's what we call second generation and third generation analogs. The promising compounds. So we start these ADME properties well in advance so that we know how the modification is changing different properties which will be needed to take it forward. So three major properties we start looking at very early is the solubility, a microsomal stability, liver microsomal stability, and a log D value. Log D value is the uh, coefficient of uh, the partition coefficient between uh, octanol and the polar, polar solvent. So we try to get these three numbers for most of our compounds to move forward. And before testing for efficacy in animals, 
you generally take your compound, do an in vivo PK, try to find out the half-life, what is the concentration, maximum concentration, and what is the bioavailability of that compound. So this is a general scheme to establish an SAR. So what are the basic pharmacochemical properties we look into? We look into molecular weight, which is the mass of the molecule. We look at the polar surface area. So surface is some of the all polar atoms, including hydrogens. And this is very important for cell permeability. So we look at that property very, and there are some software by which you can determine the polar surface area of the molecule. And especially if you're working in CNS, you need to have a particular range of the polar surface area first for, for brain uh, perimeter. We look at the solubility. So solubility is, is in PBS at 7.4 and we determine in micro, micro mole. Uh, log D, as I said, uh, distribution coefficient. Uh, log P also, sometimes we look at the log P values, which is a ratio of unionized versus unionized compound in two different solvents. And this is Lipinski rule of five. So where we look at molecular weight has to be less than 500. The C log P has to be less than five. There should be less than five hydrogen bond donors in the molecule and less than 10 hydrogen bond acceptors in the molecule. So this is a Lipinski rule that came out from years of work in industry. And they have come up with these parameters that these things are more drug-like. So we look at those parameters. But we are not strict on that because newer drugs are generally coming out of this Lipinski rule. So there is a different group saying that this is no more that effective to, to, to uh, take it into consideration. So there are two basic pharmacokinetic properties we look at. One is uh, MLM, my, uh, mouse liver microsome rat liver microsome and human liver microsome. It depends upon which animal model you are using. If you are using mouse, so then we look at the MLM. If you are using rat, we are gonna look at the RLM, but we look at the human microsome to start. So what is that? That is a percentage of the compound remaining after 60 minutes, uh, or we calculate the T halves of that. So there are several different kinds of enzymes in the body that changes, uh, uh, that, that destroys the compound. Let me put it in a, in a very simple way. And here are some of the examples of those six isozymes we look at, and we have an in-house capability to run that. Uh, and then we also look at the hepatocytes, and that's also in mouse, rat, and humans, and that also gives us the T half. These are the liver cells, and basically these are gonna tell us the second pass metabolites on the, uh, uh, if you have, for example, a phenol in the molecule is going to go to the glu glucuronidation. So that's the second pass metabolism of that compound. The parent molecule will not be there after some time. It will be glycosylated and maybe you will have less activity of the compound because of that. So the question comes, how you, how you can change a potency or a solubility, how to improve it? So there is no set rules to do that. It, it comes by experience, by looking at different series, what we work on. But I'm going to give you some examples what we look into in general. So, for example, you can, if you want to solubilize compound into a polar solvent, you need to introduce some polar groups in there. So, for example, introduce some hydroxy group in there, acid group, a cyanide group. So, that's what we look into to increase solubility of a molecule. Cycloalkyls with the hydroatoms. So, that means you are introducing some basic nature to the molecule, so we use heteroatoms. Uh, we insert heterocycles like pyrimidine, you read those kind of structures in there. Uh, we try to disturb the intramolecular hydrogen bonding, that's gonna increase the solubility of the molecule. And insert group while allowing to rotate within the molecule and that also disturbs the planarity. So for example, if you have a biphenyl system, so two benzene rings are joined together, it's a planar system. And that's gonna stack on top of each other in the, in, the, in the crystalline form, so you will have less solubility. So how to do that? Break the carbon-carbon bond between two aromatic rings, put a heteroatom, for example, put an NH in between, now you have a bent structure. There is a polar group in there, so it's not gonna stack, so you are gonna increase the solubility of the molecule. So those are some tricks we use uh, while we do the SAR. Metabolism is another very important Thing which we start looking at very early and how to improve that. So we have some structural alert molecules. We know that these are problematic. So we try to avoid those structures uh, used in there. 
we try to have the replacement, which in chemistry term we call a, a bioisosters. So for example, you have an acid group. Acid group is a charged group, right? Charge group is making it more binding to SIPs, for example. So how to eliminate that? We use tetrazole in place of a carboxylic acid. So we put a cyclic linear structure with four nitrogen there, it's gonna give you the same character of the carboxylic acid. And that's what we call bioisoster. So there are a list of groups, functional groups that we can replace and have the same effect. Block the potential sites of the metabolism. For example, in aryl ring system, they are oxidized very easily. So you try to substitute the aromatic rings with particular groups to decrease the metabolism of the molecule. Now, we also have some computational programs in house. So one of the examples I'm gonna give you is a star drop. So there is a program, star drop, that has a literature of close to, I will say three, 400,000 compounds in there. So they have already run the models on that. So by which you can actually find out which area in your molecule will be metabolized faster than the other. And there are different, different SIPs in there. So you can have an idea looking at a structure without making the compound. Sometimes you fail also, but success rate is, I will say more than 70% that is gonna behave the same way. So here is the paper just published in Journal of uh, Chemical Information and Modeling using this technology. And as you can see over here, so this is the molecule. The red means it's gonna metabolize faster. The green is the slowest. And it's, it gives us a graph like that. It gives us a CSL value, which is called composite site liability value, lower the value, better the compound is. So we actually input our structures in there, we try to change it, try to calculate those numbers to prioritize the compounds because we don't want to make 10,000 compounds, we just want to make good compounds easily so that we can move our programs forward. So we use these kind of technologies in-house to find which analog should be made first than the later, okay? So what are structural errors? I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about it. Structural errors are like in centered reactivity, uh, DNA reactions, uh, metal coordination is a big one. We try to avoid that. Uh, and these can give you uh, mutagenicity, it can give you SIP inhibition, it can give you direct toxicity, uh, those kind of uh, carcinogenicity. So that's what we would like to have the structural alert removed from it. But these structural alerts are not the means it's not alone a uh, predictor of adverse outcome. There can be others, but this is a good starting point. That's what we say. Other factors we can look into clinical doses, uh, route of drug clearance, and those kind of things come later in the picture. So structural alerts are not 100% safe, means there are some uh, negatives in there too. So that's what this caution I have written in here. Some molecules with a structural alerts may never generate any adverse toxicity. So sometimes if a molecule is very nice, I generally go and get secondary testing cytotoxicities of those compounds to see whether it's giving me or not giving me, whether I can take this compound forward or not. So this is very early we look at. For example, a nitrophenyl compound is bad, bad for me, but there are drugs that has nitro. So nitroimidazole, the latest TB drug, has a nitro aromatic ring system. The mechanism is the anode production of that drug. So that's why it doesn't give you those kind of cytotoxicity what is given in the literature for that particular group. So sometimes uh, you will find some examples uh, in, the, in the literature. So what, like, what are the guidelines to drug-like properties? So here you can see the step one, we look at the structure, we check the solubility, we check the log D, we check the mouse liver microsomes, and other, other things in there. We select compound with, a, with our range of uh, inhibitory, uh, inhibitory numbers. And then the step two, we try to do optimization. We increase the bioavailability of the compound. We try to have a higher T half. Uh, the clearance has to be slow. So we look at other, other things. So we look at the non-target selectivity profile, uh, plasma protein binding of that molecule. Uh, we look at the cardiac toxicity by her. So we look at different panels of these, and these comes in the second stage of the program. And then it goes to the proof of concept studies or preclinical development, where we, we look at 
uh, other stuff like gen uh, genetic toxicity, uh, in vivo studies and the dose response according to that, uh, biomarkers, we define the mechanism of action sometime at that stage and differentiation with the known drugs. Now, if we have a CNS program, these are the additional things we do on that. So if we have a CNS program, we look at smaller the better, we look at the log D has to be between two and four, polar surface area has to be less than 70. So we look at those parameters just to eliminate the alerts right there. So for CNS, we have added some uh, more. And then also we look at the brain to plasma ratios, whether it's going into brain or not, and how much is going to brain as compared to the plasma concentration. So that's an additional step doing uh, uh, CNS program. So once we, once we have a program, we generally make this kind of a table for our chemists to work on, where we decide what should be the antiviral value for a compound to go into proof of concept studies. So for example, in our 83C antiviral program, we have chosen that EC50 has to be less than 250 nanomolar, or EC90 has to be less than one micromolar to, to take a compound forward. Uh, cytotoxicity has to be greater than 30 molecular weight. We try to be less than 500 or around 500 polar surface area between 40 and 70, because a lot of these viruses, the viremia happens in the brain, so we need to have compound going into brain also. Uh, the solubility has to be greater than 10 micromolar. Experimental log D is somewhere between two and four, and microsomal stability in mice has to be greater than 60, for humans has to be greater than 60. So this is kind of a parameter we come up with for every drug discovery program, and that's what we use to take compound form. So what are the medicinal chemistry strategy? In a nutshell, we synthesize compound, we test compounds, we look at the PK properties and decide whether it's gonna go forward or this series is terminated. And that's what this slide shows here. Basically, we have a compound, we are starting with a 10 micromolar compound, we are taking it to less than 100 nanomolar, for example, we are increasing the selectivity, it has a good PK, this is going forward into in vivo. However, if our compound has just gone from 10 micromolar to between one and five micromolar, compound is not that selective, it has a poor PK properties, we terminate that series further. We don't want to invest more time in it. So I'm gonna give you a particular uh, example of a program, which is an antiviral program, as I said, so you take active compounds from high throughput screen. This is the circle what we use. We synthesize compound, we test compound, we look at their in vitro properties, and this is what we call a lead generation or optimization program. So that goes into circle all the time because we need to see what is working, what is not working. And from here, we choose compounds. They go to lead compounds. The target values are set for it. They go to the secondary assays. For example, in anti antiviral program, we go with the virus titer reduction. We do in vivo PK studies on, on the compounds which are good. That has a PO means oral, oral dose. Half-life is greater than two hours and it has a 30% uh, F value in there. Now, if there is a problem with the in vivo testing, we take the compound back into the lead generation optimization program, try to come up with another compound that can move forward. That's why this arrow is going back there. If everything is fine with the in vivo PK, we take it to the Moody model in this case. So we, we, we look at the potency, efficacy, and acute toxicity of the molecule. There is any issue there, go back to the drawing board, start from the scratch. And so this is a cycle that what we do. And if everything goes fine, then we look at the plasma protein binding. We look at the hepatocyte stability, we look at the SIP inhibitions with the panel, we look at mini AMs, HERG, and we look at the selectivity profile. Everything clear, compound goes into forward for preclinical studies. So the question comes, if one property is not optimized, whether we should keep that compound or throw it away. So that's why this slide actually we make, we have to have a right balance. Maybe you have a compound that has one uh, that has 500 nanomolar versus a 250 nanomolar compound, but the properties of 500 nanomolar is better. We try to take that compound forward. So that's why this slide over here. So we look at the potency, selectivity, and toxicity. 
We look at solubility, molecular weight, and metabolic stability. We look at the bioavailability, half-life, brain penetration, for example. We look at the optimized. So we look at the balanced optimized candidate from there. That's going to go into the in vivo efficacy model for proof of concept. So we try to take different properties into account and try to have the optimized molecule from there, a balanced molecule also. So I'm going to give you real examples over here. So this is a chickpea compound, 33366. So this is the starting compound we have. And as you can see, this has an EC90 value of about 3.2 micromolar, a viral title reduction of less than two. But the compound looks interesting. So we took it forward. The microsomal stability is very bad. And that's why it's pink in there. It's 12 minutes. Human is decent, 64 minutes. The solubility is 5 micromolar, which is, I will say, close to our target value of 10 micromolar. So this is our starting molecule here. What we do? We start making compounds in different, different areas of the molecule. So for example, I took this OME over here. So this is the O methoxy group. I would like to introduce other groups in there and see how the activity is changing. And that's what this R represents over here. So I make O methyl, O ethyl, O propyl, isopropyl, O phenyl and try to see what kind of groups are tolerated here uh, that can give us activity. Then I move to this NH amide molecule, amide part over here. I am changing structure on this side and seeing how the activity is moving. Then I looked at this six member ring system. So when I started on this program, I looked at this molecule when I put it, because this is a commercial molecule. So I went into the commercial database and found out there are about 6,000 compounds already made on this scaffold. What else I can do in there? Okay, so my changing of this molecule is very limited. So I said, okay, what to do? If I change this six membered ring into a five membered ring or a seven membered ring, I have an IP there. So I move forward in that direction. So we, that's what this molecule is. N means we are changing number of carbons in the ring there. In this case, we change at two areas. And after, after making close to 80 compounds, we came down to this compound, which is called 34963. It has a potency of 390 nanomolar EC90. It has a virus title reduction of four logs at 10 micromolar. It has a decent MLM, I will say 47 minutes. I would like to have more than that. And then HLM is about 50 minutes, but I lost my solubility. Now solubility is only half micromolar. It's an issue for me. So I went back and I started this circle again. I started making more analogs, defined analogs so that I can increase the potency and increase solubility, increase microsomal stability. I made about close to 80 analogs there. Yes. So your first cycle, how, how, how long did it take for you to finish the first cycle? The first cycle, 80 compounds, a chemist generally makes close to two compounds a week. So we have put four chemists in there, three chemists in there, just to have fast data. It depends what are the finances of the program. This program has good money. So that's why we were able to do a lot of stuff in there. But if you have only one chemist, the program is going to go slow. So that's why in industry, they put 15, 20 chemists in one program, try to push it within two months and have a lead molecule in two months for proof of concept. So it all depends upon the logistic of the project. But here at Southern, we have limited amount of chemist, limited money, so that's how we flow. So now we have this compound, which is called as a 34963. It's a, it's a better compound, right? So we took that compound, try to move forward. So now in this seven member ring, so to increase, as I said, to increase the solubility, you have to increase, introduce the polar group. So I went and put an amide group in there and see whether that changes the solubility. Yeah, it changed the solubility, but I lost the potency. I made amine. Yeah, there was potency in there. The solubility was there, but not as good as I wanted. So I started making compounds. I introduced amides, sulfonamides. Sulfonamides increases solubility. It's a red alert also, but there are so many drugs in the market. So now it's a safe structure. So we started doing these iteration in there, and we reached to a molecule called 36498. Now this molecule, if you look at it, this is called amide NHCO phenyl. In this case, we reverse it, and we call it as a reverse amide. So we made just, just by reversing this piece over here, from here to here, 
we lost some of the potency, but we, we are increasing towards the microsomal stability. And this one has more IP space for us. So he said, okay, this is a good starting point right there. We are still losing solubility because the seven membered ring is gonna make it more insoluble. And then we do, we did some modification again. We tried to introduce some groups. As you can see, we have introduced, for example, a nitrogen in there. So we are converting from phenyl to pyridyl. That's gonna increase solubility of the molecule. But this, this compound was so sensitive to these changes, either we were getting good compounds or we are losing all the activity in the series, which is very bizarre in some cases. We end up with a compound called 39689. As you can see, we lost some of the potencies, about 850 nanomolar now. VTR has gone up five, micro, five logs within 10, micro, uh, 10 micromolar. MLM, now we have 126 minutes. Good concrete compound. HLM, greater than 300 minutes. So it stays in the, in, in, in the system. Solubility, we are still struggling. Now what we can do, we can use formulation studies to solubilize some of the compound which has low solubility. So we took that approach. So this is the profile of the compound. So once we have a compound, med can people, they generally try to make this kind of a table where all the data is there. As you can see here, all the EC50, EC90, uh, MLM, the clearance data, uh, PAP is cell permeability data. How it is flowing through cells in and out, right? So that's data, so it's, it's a decent, uh, 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 cell permeability data. We look at the plasma protein binding, how much it is binding. So it is binding 99.9%, that means 0.1% fraction is unbound. These numbers are not very accurate because we are doing an in vitro system. In vivo, on and off rate is there. So your compound is 99.9% .9 bound, but is being unbound and being bound and that's how it increases the concentration in cells. So this is a relevant number, but sometimes you can use the compound further. And we have also tested this compound against other viruses too. So we have a lot of interest in this compound. So we tried different formulation. We came down to this formulation, which is 15% DMA and 85% PAC400. We took this compound to in vivo. This is the graph. So we generally take all four routes uh, to a single dose, so 40 mix per cake. We took IV, uh, IV is always one mix per cake, and then we have 40 mix per cake of PO, IP, and SC using this mouse strain over here. And as you can see here, one is better than the other. So this, this gives us an idea which is the good route for our animal studies. So we selected subcutus injection in this case. So this is what we get from the pharmacokinetic group. So they give us a uh, uh, concentration of the compound at different time points. That's how we choose compounds. So if you look at this compound, this compound is going from 2.19 to 0.67 within 24 hours. We try to see which compound is going slower than, which route is going slower than the other. So that's why we chose uh, uh, the subcutus in this case. We also look at the T half over here. And sometimes what happened, one mouse gives you different value than the other two. So we try to eliminate that and has the two we take. So that's how we, we look at this data to take it forward. Now, as I said, we are looking into brain to plasma ratios too. So after getting that in vivo study, in this case, we did an IP, 40 mix per K, and we tried to see how much is in the plasma, how much is in the brain, and as you can see, there is a high concentration of this compound in brain, and that's what we want. So this is a. So when you're doing with the slides, you're doing males and females, and they're seeing if it has the same effect between genders, or mm -hmm. that 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 is there, but it costs us a lot. So we generally try to see in one species, and most of the time, we have a male model set up over here. So we do do it in male. Once the compound moves forward, then we try to go in both male and female. These are very preliminary data we go through. And I will show you the differences in one of my slides. So then we took this compound and we did a mini toxic study at OHSU. And basically we look at the formulation toxicity also. So we look at the formulation toxicity at 100 microliter, non-toxic. And in this case, we took the male and female mice for the testing of uh, toxicity in this case. So we do uh, IP, a uh, five days dosing, uh, BID two times a day. 
and our compound was formulated in only 50 microliters because we we, can, we we are thinking maybe we can go to 80 mix per kg if there is not much effect at 40 mix per kg. Uh, those so during the toxicity studies we take out the tissues and those tissues are being shipped to us and then we have a, a, a pharmacokinetic group at ESA that looks at the concentration of compound in different tissues whether it reaches those tissues or not. So in this case we we got the brain, spleen, kidney, liver, and so on and so forth. And the samples were analyzed and we have found that the compound was present in all tissues. And we are talking about 12 hours post-injection. So it's a lot of time the compound is degradating in there. And this, this is male and female differences you can see over here. So this is a 20 mix per kick female. This is a 20 mix per kick male. And you can see it's working better in male as compared to female. Uh, and, and, and we took a 40 mix per kick, but these differences are not that significant. In, in our study. So we move forward with this. We did a very quick proof of concept study to see whether this compound is working or not. And as you can see here, we did a three day challenge study using 10 to the power three PFU per ml. And this is our starting point over here. These are given by injection on the right ankle, right paw of the mice. So you will see more concentration of virus in the right as compared to left, as you can see right here. But this is going to give us a, a quick proof of concept whether the compound is working or not. This is another study we did for West Nile virus. So this was our starting compound with EC90 of 3.2. Again, we did all those changes. I'm not going to go through one. So, and then we came out with a molecule 38841 that has 870 nanomolar EC90 with three and a half logs of virus titer. So these were the three best candidates we had. And as you can see, we have chosen this 38841 for our studies because it has higher microsomal stability. Solubility was a challenge in this case also, but we were able to formulate this compound for proof of concept studies. So as I said, medicinal chemists make these kind of tables to start with. And then we made a HCL salt of it to increase the solubility. So that's what I put this example in here that you can make some salts also to increase solubility. So we made SCL sort of this to increase solubility. We were able to formulate in 2% DMSO, 3% uh, PAG and HP beta CD. We did all four routes and then we decided PO is the best route for us at 40 mix per K. And we took, also we did a brain to plasma concentration for this compound also because West Nile goes into brain and that's how the death occurs uh, after five days of the infection in mice. So as you can see, we have a lot of compound in our brain area. So this was a good compound to take forward. So other than that, we also look at the metabolites of this. So we can do these studies. So we take our compound, put it in the liver microsomes, digest it for 60 minutes or 120 minutes, and then analyze by, uh, by uh, MSMS and try to find where the molecule is being oxidized or being fragmented, those kind of studies. So this is one example I showed you over here. This is, this is the main compound. This is after 60 minutes, it was only 86% left. 14% are these different combinations you can have. Sometimes you have more conversion and you make those, you make those metabolites in lab and test it to see whether that metabolite is the better compound than your previous compound. So those kind of work we also do on the side. Uh, we, we also did the uh, mini toxic study, as I said, five days, 40 mix per cake BID, no toxicity. And we are doing the survival uh, challenge model on this compound. I'm gonna give you one last example. This is a failure, because I want to introduce failure also in my talk. This is one molecule we started. We are trying to look into dual inhibitor of beef and chikungunya. They both belong to the same virus family. So we are thinking maybe this is a good compound to move forward for two viruses. This is the data we had. And looking at this data, we wanted to improve the potency and metabolic stability. So here you say this is the pink over here. So we would like to improve here. And also we would like to increase the, uh, decrease the EC90 values for this compound. We use the CSL calculator for it, and this is the CSL result from there. We know which points are sensitive in this molecule, and we should make those analogs first rather than later. We again started doing the same thing. 
we made different different substitution we came down to a compound which is 41144 it has a poor mlm but we were able to improve some uh, some activity on this compound also to generate ip we we needed to change this head group over here and that's that's what we changed the head group of this molecule we made about 75 analogs in this series we came down to a, this molecule that was not better than the previous one but it has better microsomal stability and decent solubility we can take this compound in proof of concept that was our thought then we made another compound which was very specific for we is called 42777 and it was it is a pretty nice compound ec50 and ec90 wise uh it has a decent microsomal stability right here you can see solubility was very nice 54 micromolar so we thought this is a good compound we did the formulation we used 10% nmp 60% pack 400 and 30% saline we were able to solubilize this compound we did a 40 mix per kg in vivo study of it we didn't find anything in there everything was clear so fast we were not able to see that from the structure itself so the real world sometimes is different than what you are what what experiences you have so sometimes so we drop this series mm -hmm. so this is this this is this also happens and i'm going to give you an overview of what we did in last 5 years in this ad3c program we made about 1500 compounds for six different viruses we took 25 hts hit to lead campaigns and we have only six chemists working on this program for last 5 years so we have total of six chemists on six viruses and then with flavi virus we have two hits dengue we have four hits corona we had five hits alpha viruses we have six and four influenza we had four hits we did 16 lead to a lead optimization studies which are some are ongoing also we took five lead compounds into into in vivo pk studies four lead compounds in animal efficacy studies so this is what we have done so far in this program this is just a slide to show that the what the chemistry department has the capabilities in there we can do all of those things in house and that's why we have a very vigorous drug discovery program in southern research so we can do most of the stuff needed for a pre, up to a pre clinical studies in house this is my acknowledgement slide as you can see this is a big team uh several people were in and out also as you can see the past members here they were in then they left so this is the whole program uh, outlined for the medicinal chemistry core and there are a lot of thanks to them and thank you very much any questions you can answer uh this is my contact info if you want to contact me and have some discussions on your programs i have put my cards outside you can grab one of the cards from outside if you have any program we'd love to call you guys any questions from the top of the head